Hello, good afternoon. Welcome any and all. Code, yay, welcome, good to see you. AF, welcome, no capitals, welcome, and welcome all who come now or later, whenever you find this. I hope you're doing all right. One moment at a time. So today, we're getting back into the music lesson, A Spiritual Search for Growth Through Music by Victor L. Wooten, who's a Grammy Award winner. <laughs> This chapter we're getting into, Measure 6, is entitled Dynamics. Most people play louder to get someone's attention, but getting quieter can stop a bull from charging. All you Taurus out there, all you bulls. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, let's dig in. The exercise with the rock had me thinking. I'd never seen or accomplished anything like it and I wondered how else that ability could be used. Feeling tired and excited from our morning excursion, I threw myself onto the couch. Michael sat in the chair across from me with his eyes closed. Every so often, he would face his right palm toward the wall, slowly moving it back and forth. I knew that he lived in a different world, so I didn't pay much attention to what he was doing. I was half asleep, daydreaming about my rock when he asked me an apparently non-related question. Got any Curtis Mayfield? Oh yeah, CD, vinyl, 8-track, I have it all. I love Curtis Mayfield. What do you want to hear? A CD will do. How about Superfly? I have that one, I replied, hopping off the couch. I know you do, Michael stated. Close your eyes and find it for me. <laughs> I stopped in my tracks. What do you mean? Close my... How am I supposed to do that? I looked at him and frowned. You did it with a rock, he answered, opening his eyes to look at me. He was right. I had done it with a rock, but I didn't know how I was supposed to do the same thing with a CD. Also, there were only five rocks to choose from. I had hundreds of CDs in my living room alone. My excitement quickly faded. I shifted my weight back and forth, trying to decide what to do. Ah, I think there's a... AF, welcome back. Hey, Michelle, great to see you. And that way. I love you. Hugs, group hugs. Okay. He was right. I had done it with a rock, but I didn't know how I was supposed to do the same thing with the CD. Also, there were only five rocks to choose from. I had hundreds of CDs in my living room alone. My excitement quickly faded. I shifted my weight back and forth, trying to decide what to do. Feeling confused and frustrated, I chose to sit back down on the couch. Ignoring my frustration, Michael gave more instructions. This time, you should not feel for your emotion, you should feel for his. Whose? I asked, tilting my head to the side. Curtis Mayfield's. He leaned back and closed his eyes again. Oh boy, I thought out loud. I fell back on the couch, trying to figure out where to begin. I was lost. I tried to relate the CDs to the rocks, but it didn't help. Maybe if I could hold the CD for a while first. I looked at Michael. His eyes were still closed. I was about to ask for more help but he spoke first. Mo uh, motioning toward the shelf with his finger, he commanded, stop thinking and go do it. Not trusting myself to keep my eyes closed, I picked up a skull cap from the floor and pulled it down over my eyes. I managed to walk over to the bookshelf without bumping into anything, which to me was worth a treat. But I had no idea where any of my Curtis Mayfield CDs were. I also had no idea how I was supposed to find them without looking. I didn't even know if they were in that room. The thought of giving up was making its way to the forefront, but I forced it back. With no confidence on my side, I took a wild guess. No, that's Fleetwood Mac, future games, Michael said. Right era, wrong group, choose again. Hey mama, you can sit up here. Or not. She's been so, I don't know, she's been really meowing a lot at me to this week. There you go, sweetheart. <clears throat> How he knew which CD I'd fingered from across the room was a mystery to me, but I put the disc on the floor so I could check it later. I tried again. Joni Mitchell, Shadows and Light, Good Music, Wrong CD, Michael stated. No way! I peeked at him from under the hat. His eyes were still closed, so I looked down at the CD in my hand. He was right. How could he have known without looking? I glanced back at him and saw him smile. No cheating, he said, wiggling his finger again. again. 
I tried three more times to no avail. Give me the hat, Michael ordered, sounding a bit disgusted. From his chair, he reached for the hat. I threw it at him. Without opening his eyes, he caught it and put it on, pulling it down over his eyes as I'd done. Rising from his chair, he spun around three times and then proceeded to walk backwards over to the bookshelf just to assure me that he couldn't see. Reaching the shelf, he pulled out whatever CD he wanted. It wouldn't have been that easy for me if I'd done it with my eyes open. The Beatles, Abbey Road, he stated with complete confidence. Prince, Dirty Mind, Return to Forever, No Mystery, and Debbie Gibson, Electric Youth. You have a very diverse musical palette, he added with a touch of sarcasm. He held each disc up so I could see it. I stood there stunned with my mouth wide open. He was correct each time. And last but not least, he said, reaching down to his right, Curtis Mayfield, Superfly, the soundtrack album. My mouth opened wider. I was more than amazed at what, had, what I'd just witnessed. It was way more astonishing than The Rock's. Remember, he was blindfolded with his back to the CDs. How he knew which CD was which was beyond my comprehension. Shall I continue, he asked. Why did he have to find my Debbie Gibson CD? I knew I would never hear the end of that one. I was also secretly afraid of what else he might find. No, no, that's enough, I answered. To feed my curiosity and hide my embarrassment, I quickly asked a question. How did you do that? I did it very well, he answered, removing the hat and taking a bow. Very funny, but really, can you give me a hint how you did it? I can tell you exactly how I did it, he told me. He sat on the edge of the couch, poised and ready. He took his seat across from me and laid the hat in his lap. Then, folding his arms and pausing a moment, he finally began speaking. Earlier, when I found your rock, you tuned in to the emotions stored inside it. These were your emotions, and because they were fresh, the dynamics were powerful, like a fresh scent to a bloodhound. With the CDs, I did the same thing, except that the emotions were not my own and the dynamics were much less than they were in the rocks. Therefore, I needed to turn up my own dynamics. Emotion is stored inside music on every CD, and even if the CD is sitting on the shelf, it can still be felt. Learning to discern the emotions of each artist is the trick. You tuned into the emotions of the artists on the CD? I asked in disbelief. Exactly. Have you ever noticed when you hear a song such as Amazing Grace, it makes you feel different? You can tell there is something special dwelling within that song. Well, there are tons of emotions stored in there. And if you knew the origin behind that particular song, it would make complete sense to you. I've always known that the song has a special effect. I've always known that the song has a special effect on me. Every time I hear it, I feel quieter and calmer. It's similar to feeling it's similar to the feeling I get every time I take a walk in the woods. I once heard about the comp I once heard about the composer of the song being on a ship lost at sea. While looking at the stars, he had a revelation of some sort. That was all I knew. I wanted to know the rest of the story, but I would have to do some research. Maybe it would help me get a better understanding of what Michael was talking about. <clears throat> I am talking about vibrations and how strongly they can be felt, he said. Most people would say that the man wrote the song when actually the situation he was in created it. He just happened to be aware enough to pick up on it. The situation wrote the song? I have to think about that one. What about the man? He had more to do with it than just being aware, right? I asked. Of course he did. All vibrations need a conduit before they can be born, and he was it. A vibration is nothing until it has something to bounce off of. This, again, is yin-yang. In order to have something, you must first have something else. The song already existed. He was the something else that allowed it to exist then and there. Dude. <laughs> Whenever he talked about vibrations, I knew I would have to work hard to understand. I usually needed to revisit the information before I could completely get it. But right then, he was not waiting for me. Have you ever had an idea you didn't act on, only to find out later that someone else did? 
In other words, someone stole your idea? Of course I have. Many times, I answered. Oh, I think I finally got that hair. Dude, that was driving me nuts. Yes, we are all the conduits, right? Yes. Well, he continued, your idea is never yours alone. It's in the air for anyone to pick up. Actually, when you think about an idea, it grows stronger, making it easier for others to feel it. Ideas create vibrations, and these vibrations can be felt in music. Amazing Grace is a perfect example. You can still feel the original vibrations from that song, I asked. Yes, the dynamics of the original vibrations are very faint. But because they've been upheld by other people for many years, the vibrations are still here. It is much like looking at a photograph of someone who is special to you. The age of the photograph does not matter. The person's vibrations can still be felt. Sometimes, the older the picture, the stronger the vibrations. <clears throat> he walked over to the bookshelf and instantly pulled out a CD that included the song Amazing Grace. Once again, I was surprised at his ability. Pointing to the disc, he continued speaking. This song is still sacred, but it doesn't mean the same thing to people that it once did. I do feel something from that song, I remarked, and I know that there's more to it than a simple melody. How can I learn to be as sensitive as you are? If you knew how to go inside, how to go within yourself, it would become, or it would come very quickly and easily to you. That is why I urge you to pursue meditation and mind exercises. You already have a great deal of sensitivity. All people do. Maybe not enough to do what I just did, but enough to understand what I am talking about. I already have a great deal of sensitivity, I asked, pointing at myself. Then can you show me a way to develop it, please? I already did. You did? Yes, with the rock, he answered. Oh, yeah. In the wake of Michael's astonishly, astonishing exhibition with the CDs, I had quickly forgotten about my own feet with the rocks. I did have a good start already. I didn't know anyone else who could do what I'd done. So you see, you are already well on your way. He walked back to the chair. Practice that, and I will need to show you nothing else. But since I know you won't practice, I will give you another example. <laughs> Hey, speaking of rocks, um, this weekend, my friend and bandmate, Corey, he took me to this amazing store in Akron called the Dragon's Mantle. It was this Wiccan shop, and I'd never been there before. And um, he bought me a stone, and it's a, bit, it's a stone that I've been looking for everywhere, every, play, every rock or gem or occult or magic or any place that I've gone that sells stones has not had it. Well, actually, that's not true. I finally found one store that had it, and it was beautiful. But it, it's, it's it's a rare stone, and um, it was like it was like it was like 150 bucks, and I wasn't ready to throw down for it. But I have now a piece of bumblebee jasper, and dang, check this out, you guys. I I, I mean, the video won't do it justice, but still, it's just it's so amazing. I love it. I'm so thankful. I'm so blessed. I, I'm so excited about having this stone. So yeah, I really haven't stopped picking it up or having it on my body or like within like arm's reach since he bought it for me. It's so cool. Bumblebee Jasper. This is a big piece too. Man. Oh, also while I was there, um, I picked up an application to read cards, tarot and oracle cards. I haven't, I haven't, um, we'll see. I really, it was a good feel in there and it smelled great, like incense and sage. <laughs> we'll see what shakes. <clears throat> Buddy, <laughs> welcome. I'm so glad you're listening to this book too. It's so cool. Look at this cool rock. It grows right by the side of a volcano. Dude, so cool. Okay. <clears throat> okay, back to it. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. But since you won't, I'll give you another. I will give you another example. But since, but since I know you won't practice, I will give you another example. I didn't know if he really knew me that well, or if he was just baiting me into start baiting me to start practicing. Either way, it didn't matter. I was going to get all the information I could. Okay, show me, I said. The hands, he began, rotating his open palms in the air. The hands have a tremendous amount of sensitivity. Reiki. What is the first thing you do when you get injured? He didn't give me a chance to think of an answer. Before you think, you touch it with your hands. It doesn't matter if it is your injury or if you if it is your injury or somebody it doesn't matter if it is your injury or someone else's. You just feel the urge to touch it. Why is that? Again, he didn't wait for an answer. It's because of an ancient memory, an instinct you have about your hands. This memory knows that your hands are sensitive and that they have a healing ability. So your hands immediately spring into action as soon as, let's say, a bee stings you. Bumblebee Jasper, what? <laughs> it happens before you think. Ancient memory? Healing? My hands have instinct? That is nonsense. You're t what is this nonsense you're talking about? I cried out. Michael quickly picked up the skullcap from his lap and threw it at my face. Without thinking, I reached up and caught it with my left hand. Wow, Michael shouted. That was awesome. How long did you have to practice catching hats like that with your left hand before you... Shut up, Michael. I get your point. <laughs> I fell back on the couch and thought about what had just happened. My left hand had just responded instinctively, and I'm not left-handed. Maybe my hands do have a memory, and if they can remember how to protect, maybe they can remember how to heal. Boom! Dude. I liked the thought, even though I was a little upset about Michael being right again. <laughs> I looked at my hands and then over at him. He was leaning back and smiling as if he were enjoying my thoughts right along with me. When I was finished, he continued speaking. The hands seem to have a desire of their own. They also react when you are in love. You have a desire to touch the person you are in love with. You also have a desire to touch the one you hate albeit in a different way. Michael chuckled. The desire is still there. Children desire to touch everything too. They touch with their feet, noses, or any other part of their bodies. They love to touch. Now here is an exercise that will show you how to reach out and touch. I sat up straight with excitement at the thought of learning something, anything, which might allow me to do as he'd done. Michael told me to stand up and position myself about 10 feet away from the stereo speakers. He said that I should stand at a close distance so I wouldn't get my emotions confused. I had no idea what he was talking about. Then he told me to turn away from the speakers, raise my right hand to about chest level, and face my palm out away from me. He placed a CD in the player and pressed play. It was Curtis Mayfield. What I want you to do, he instructed, is slowly turn around in a complete circle. Pay attention to what you feel in your palms when you face the music versus when you don't. I did exactly as he asked. Now let's cut to the chase here. It worked. I felt a difference. I was shocked, and I am still shocked every time I share this exercise with someone. It works. And on my first try, as soon as I faced the speakers, I could feel a slight tingling sensation in my palm. It was faint, but I could feel it. I wasn't sure at first if it was just feeling the actual sound waves coming from the speakers or the energy, but I could feel something. As if reading my thoughts, Michael kept the music playing but completely turned down the volume. He asked me to repeat the exercise. He said that turning down the volume would assure me that I was feeling the emotions from the music and not the vibration from the speakers. It was harder to feel this time. I think my mind got in the way. It usually does after the first success, but I could still feel it, and it surprised me. Wow, what was that? I asked. I was like a little boy on Christmas morning, my mouth wide open in shock. Emotion, energy, vibration, life, love, music, call it what you want, he answered. The fact that you could feel it, even when you couldn't hear it, is what is important. You now know 
that something is there. Dude. Ah. <laughs> Ooh, that's so cool. No capitals. I love those kind of sales. Yeah. It was faint, but I felt it. I know that I did, I exclaimed, my voice revealing my excitement. Michael spoke softly as he explained. When vibrations are coming out faintly from an object, like speakers, for instance, our first reaction may be to turn up the volume. Another approach would be to turn up our own volume, our receiving volume. We can turn up and down what we receive at any time. Married couples do it all the time, hearing only what they choose to hear and when they choose to hear it. This situation is similar. You adjust your own dynamics in situations when you cannot or choose not to. Adjust the dynamics of the other object. His talk of vibrations always seemed to confuse me a bit. Even though he was now using the word dynamics, my confusion let me know that he was also talking about vibrations. That is why I like using Curtis Mayfield for this exercise, Michael remarked, turning up the stereo volume again. If you notice, he plays quietly, but with a lot of intensity. There aren't many artists who can do that. Most artists think the louder they play, the more emotion there is. Actually, it is the other way around. <clears throat> the emotion has to be real when you are not hiding behind loud volume. And even at this quiet level, he whispered, it would be hard for anyone not to feel the emotion coming from Curtis. Believe it or not, I'm following you. I actually understand what you're saying, I responded. Why else would I be saying it? Michael replied. Now let's try it again, but in a different way this time, a way that directly relates to playing music. He grabbed a metronome and turned it on about 50 beats per minute. Next, he brought over my vacuum cleaner and turned it on. I hadn't done that in a while. Then he turned on the TV set and asked me to play. Grab your bass and play with the click, he instructed. Play anything you want, but don't lose time with the metronome. I had to listen really hard to hear the metronome. I could barely hear it at all until I remembered to feel for it rather than listen for it. I amazed myself at how easy it was, it was once I used the correct method. Now turn it up, he advised. Within yourself, raise the dynamic of the metronome. Before I allowed myself time to think, I did what he asked. To my surprise, the click got louder. After a while, it was almost as if the television and the vacuum cleaner weren't there. Because the noise they made were constant, I was able to tune it out and play, keeping perfect time. Once, I su once I'd succeeded at that, Michael gave more instructions. Now try this, he said. Instead of hearing the click on beat one, act like it is playing on the and of beat four. Once you can hear the click on that beat, start playing again. Also, relax your shoulders a bit. As soon as he says that, I do that. <laughs> Somehow, he could tell how tense I was. I hadn't even realized it. It was harder hearing the click on the beat. But once I took a deep breath, I could do it. Before that moment, I'd never connected my hearing to my breathing. It was a little later on that I realized I was also clearly hearing his voice in spite of all the other noise. I knew the other noise was still there, but it sounded as if it had been turned down quite a bit. Hearing the click on a different beat forced me to keep my own good time rather than rely on the metronome. It was harder to do, but fortunately, not impossible. Once Michael realized that I could do it, he had me continue to change the place of the click in my mind over and over. He told me to shift the click over by a 16th beat each time, and each time I had to refocus and breathe. <clears throat> After changing the click, this time to the last 16th of beat four, Michael asked me to solo. He said that if I could solo without losing the time, my internal clock would be solid. This would help me play with any drummer, even if his timing was bad. I played with it a while longer, realizing how difficult it was not to lose the groove. In order to stay in time, I had to force myself to 
based my solo off the groove, not notes or techniques. Trying to play with the click in that unusual place also caused me to forget that the metronome was barely audible. That realization jolted me out of my groove. Great, Michael said as he stopped the click and turned off the appliances. You latched onto that, that one very well. You figured out how to adjust your hearing dynamics quickly while soloing. Now, playing in situations where it is hard to hear will be a piece of cake, and it won't matter who you are playing with. You could use some help with your timing, but we'll get to that. Man, that's amazing and simple to understand, I commented. Oh, we haven't touched the tip of the iceberg yet, he remarked. You wouldn't believe some of the other things you can do. <laughs> it sounds exciting. What I would really like to see is how to use this stiff or how to use this stuff live with a band, I told him. I would love to hear you play a gig. Really? Michael asked. Yes, for real, I answered. As quickly as you've helped me open up, I would love to see and hear you play in a real situation, a real gig. I'll bring the vacuum cleaner. Michael smiled. Just then the phone rang. It was a musician I knew named Cliff. His band, the Cliff Notes, was very popular around town. Playing with him had helped keep me afloat when I first moved to Nashville. He always booked the highest paying wedding gigs and somehow he was able to generate enough club dates to make many musicians want to play in his band. He hadn't called me in a year. I didn't know why. Knowing that my rent was due and that I had no gigs lined up made me eager to take his call. Hey, Cliff, what's up? I said. Tonight? Sure, I'm available. Okay, thanks. Panama Reds, I'll see you at nine. Finally, a gig. I was happy about the thought of income. I wasn't going to pay my whole rent. Oh, it wasn't going to pay my whole rent, but it would be a start, and maybe another gig would come out of it. I was in high spirits for a few seconds. The bottom dropped out of my excitement as soon as Michael spoke. I thought you wanted to hear me play a gig, he said. Well, yeah, but I didn't know what to say. Call Cliff, call Cliff back, Michael demanded. What? Call him back, he repeated. But he asked me to play, I whined. Call him back. It'll be okay. Just call him back. Okay, I answered hesitantly. I got Cliff on the phone and told him that my teacher Michael was in town and was actually a better player than I. Even though I hadn't heard Michael play much on the bass, I recommended that Cliff hire him instead of me. Knowing how badly I needed the money, it was hard for me to do. Cliff told me that he had double booked his band that night and was also looking for a guitar player. Dude, what's up with that? Why do bands are, what, bands are always double booking? But hey, it's worked out for me and Corey a couple of times because we've been able to fill in and stuff. It's interesting, too, to think about that. Like, I guess the bands I've been in and stuff, like, you make a show together and you play together. And it's we've never, like, I mean, I guess we, it's not so much like we're always looking for someone else to fill in a spot or something. It's, like, it's interesting. Cliff told me that he had double booked his band that night and was also looking for a guitar player. Because of their popularity, he would frequently book the band in two different places at the same time and on the same night. Since Cliff was a guitar player himself, that would leave one of his bands without one. Okay. I told him that the guitar was Michael's main instrument. To my surprise, Cliff hired us both for the same gig. Since he wouldn't be there that night, and since he hadn't heard Michael play, I assured him that all would be more than fine. What a strange coincidence. Michael didn't seem surprised at all. He just continued to smile. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> After he left my house, I battled with the anxiety I was feeling. I was both excited and nervous about playing a gig alone, or playing a gig alongside of him, not knowing how to handle these feelings. I decided to ease my mind by getting ready for the performance. It didn't work. After loading my equipment into the car, Deciding what to wear became the next challenge. I felt a headache coming on. Not knowing what to do, I sat down, trying to relax. I wondered if Michael was going through the same dilemma. After a short break, I left for the club wearing the clothes I'd had on all day. <laughs> <clears throat> mm. 
yummy. Wanting to look really dedicated, I showed up two hours early. Most of the Cliff Notes gigs are very laid back, so showing up that early is uncommon. I was the first one there. When Ralph, the drummer, arrived, we, we talked and caught up for a while. I made up a story about why he hadn't seen me gigging around town lately and acted as if I was interested in what he'd been up to. I spent the next 15 minutes trying to explain who the weird guy was who the weird guy was walking through the door carrying a skateboard and a guitar. Michael was dressed as usual, that is, unusually. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen a pair of knickerbockers. <laughs> he wore a different color sandal on each foot with checkered socks up to the knee. A hole in each sock allowed his big toe to stick out, securing his sandals to his feet. I guess that he'd left his shirt at home because he wasn't wearing one. His long flowing hair hung down, partially covering his suspenders. <laughs> Paradox, welcome in, Osimo. <clears throat> his guitar, well, it wasn't his. It was mine, the one that served as a coat rack in my living room. I hadn't realized he'd taken it. Maybe he grabbed it from the house after I'd already left. I knew that he didn't need my key to get in. Rather than upset me, it made me chuckle. How he could waltz in dressed like that, carrying my beat-up guitar without a case, was bewildering. I secretly wished I could be so bold, but I knew that I'd never be. Michael has enough boldness for both of us. <laughs> After the rest of the band arrived, we introduced ourselves to one another. It's not uncommon to show up for a gig of this type and not know many or any of the other musicians you're about to play with. Wow, what a thing. My equipment was set up on the hi-hat side of the drummer, so Michael set up to my left. Fortunately, the club had a guitar amp for him to use. I wondered if he was unprepared or if he'd somehow known the amp would be waiting for him. The sax player was warming up by religiously playing scales and practicing his finger fingerings. I pulled out my bass to do the same. Michael was sitting there reclined in a wooden chair with his feet resting on the stage. His eyes were closed. His guitar was laying on the table. Don't you need to warm up? I asked him. Do you? He replied, looking up at me. <laughs> yes, I do. How long you've been playing? He asked. About 12 years or so. And you're not warmed up yet? With that comment, he closed his eyes again. I want to be ready for, tonight, for tonight's gig. It's important to me, I answered. I've been warming up my whole life for this gig, Michael explained with his eyes still closed. It's an important one for me also. All the previous give, gigs were just rehearsals for tonight. It all leads to now. Dude, what a thing. I didn't know what to say. I also didn't know whether I should continue warming up or not. The sax player overheard our short conversation. He stopped playing, walked over, and made a snide comment to Michael. Dude, you might want to pick up your axe before the gig starts. I don't want you warming up on my time. The sax player obviously didn't know who he, who he was dealing with. I would have tried to save him if I'd had the time or the inclination. I awaited Michael's response. I see, Michael said, slowly sitting up in his chair. I could tell by his smile that he was going to enjoy this interaction. He stood up, which allowed him to look down on the sax player. Staring him straight in the eyes, he continued speaking. You're warming up your fingers because that's all you use when you play. I can already hear it. Me, I use my mind. We can compare notes after the gig if you want. You let me know. I'll be right here. <laughs> oh, son of a gun. <clears throat> Michael sat back down, propped up his feet, and closed his eyes again, waiting a while before letting his grin fade. <laughs> I knew it was on purpose. The sax man was perplexed. Michael's words had stopped him in his tracks. He just stood there not knowing what to do. I could see him thinking about it, but he didn't dare try to argue, although I silently hoped he would. I wanted to see Michael in action. Maybe after the show, I hoped. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> ah. 
The rest of the band came over to talk about a few songs. Once the set list was confirmed, the music began. Wow, they're just doing the set list now. Wild. Interesting. The first few songs went by rather smoothly, and I was feeling good about my playing. But eventually, I noticed that the people in the bar weren't listening. That had always been a pet peeve of mine, and it started to bother me. Michael didn't seem to notice, or maybe he just didn't care. But it was already getting the best of me. Finally, he spoke. Do you see that guy talking at the far end of the bar? He asked. He's wearing a white jacket. Yes, I answered. Watch him. Everyone at the bar was talking. The only people listening were the few people on the dance floor. The rest were either sitting at the bar or at the table, not listening. I didn't know what I was looking for or what Michael was planning to do. I just kept watching the man in the white jacket. Almost immediately, the man turned and looked at the stage. Someone noticed the band. This is a first. Less than a minute later, he picked up his drink and walked to the front of the room, taking a seat at the table, almost directly in front of Michael. He wasn't looking at him, but that's where he sat. Michael turned to me and smiled. I was baffled. I wasn't sure if he had caused the man to sit there or not. Maybe he could read lips and overheard the man's plans to sit up front. Unlikely. I knew that Michael was strange, and by now I was pretty sure that he had something to do with all the strange things that happened around him. Dude. How did you do that? I asked, losing the beat in the process. Ralph looked at me and frowned. I gave an apologetic glance in return. On the break. Wait till the set break. I'll explain then, Michael told me. I could hardly, hardly wait for the first intermission. Most bands take more breaks than I'm used to, so when it came time to stop, I was ready, but also surprised that it came so soon. Okay, Michael, fill me in, I said, not even waiting for him to unhook his strap. Dynamics, he replied. I used dynamics. Can you teach me to do that? It wasn't until after I'd, after I'd asked the question that I remembered his outlook on teaching. You can learn how, can you learn how to do that? That is a better question, he answered. Yeah, yeah, teach me, show me, learn me, blah, blah, blah. How can I do that? That's all I want to know. That made him laugh. He walked outside where it was quiet, and there he filled me in on his method. All right, here's what I did. It was obvious that the guy wasn't listening to the music, so I needed to get his attention. All I did was alter the dynamics of my playing, not just the volume, but also the dynamics of the elements. That caught his attention. If you noticed, he glanced at the stage a few times before making his way up there. Once I knew I had him, I turned up the dynamics. Again, I'm not just talking about volume. My volume actually got softer. That's what drew him in. You see, most people play louder to get someone's attention, but getting quieter can stop a bull from charging. That's downright amazing, I said. No, it's even better than that, he answered. That guy had no idea what attracted him to the stage. If he knew anything about our world of music, he would have noticed what I did and would have paid direct attention to me. Because he didn't know what hit him, I was able to influence his thinking. This is both awesome and dangerous for both parties involved. If you can do it to him, it can be done to you. Think about it. We are only dealing with music in this situation. Dude. I didn't totally understand what he was talking about, but one phrase caught my attention. You said, our world of music. Are you including me in your world? My eyebrows rose as I smiled, a hopeful smile. Yes, you must be a part of this world to manipulate the elements in that way. I felt proud to be included in his world, but chose not to show it. I see. Can you show me how to manipulate the elements in that way? I asked. It's easy, he answered. I'll show you how to make the audience applaud for whomever is soloing. They will go crazy for the soloist without realizing it, and you who caused them to do it. Or without realizing it was you who caused them to do it. That sounded way cool to me. You've got to show me how to do that. I was ready to get on my knees if I had to, and Michael knew it. Who's the best? He asked, opening his arms and raising one eyebrow in a playful manner. You are, Michael, you are. Who do you love? The familiar knowing smile was not showing. Oh, you, okay. Now stop it and tell me what to do. Dude. 
It was a rare thing to hear Michael joke that way. He never asked for affection or seemed to care about it. Even though I could tell he was joking, I was willing to do anything in order to learn what he had to teach. Okay, I'll show you. Okay, now I'll show you, he said with a chuckle. It's so easy. Here's what you do. When we go back up there and the horn player starts to solo, pay attention to when he's about to peak. Before he does, I want you to go up two octaves and pedal a note. Pedaling a note is when the bass player stays on one note, repeating it over and over, even though the chords may be changing. Got it? Okay, back to the story. That was all in parentheses. That was a little helping. That was from Victor. As you pedal the note, he continued, you must bring the volume down really low. Bring the volume down without losing the intensity. Think Curtis Mayfield. The drummer needs to follow you with this dynamic. So you may need to get Ralph's attention. Pedal the note for eight to 16 measures. How long is up to you, but it must be timed correctly in order for it to work. Direct your full attention to the horn player as you do it. Draw no attention to yourself. During the last two to four measures, your intensity should grow. I want you to crescendo as you descend, working the notes back down to the original octave. Then start playing your original bass line again, grooving real hard. At that point, if you've done it correctly, the audience will start applauding for the soloist. You can take credit for it on the inside, but on the inside, the credit goes to the soloist. Oh, but on the outside, you can take credit for it on the inside, but on the outside, the credit goes to the soloist. In other words, you keep quiet about what you've done. This quiet world is the world you live in as a bass player. Hmm. Just thinking about playing with Corey. The way I read him. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> that sounds easy, I said, excited to try it. Basically, I pedal a note for a few bars, then walk back down and start playing the groove again, right? Yes, but you can't forget about the dynamics. You must bring the volume down and back up at the appropriate times. This is crucial in order for it to work. Okay, I'll try it and see if it works when we get back up there. No, don't try it. Do it and make it work. You can work out the kinks right now in your mind if you want to, but when you're up there on stage, it will be time to make it work. I don't want you rehearsing on my time. He spoke the last line loud enough for everyone to hear. <laughs> <laughs> the sax player gave a glance but dared not comment <laughs> oh lord <laughs> after a quiet after a quiet chuckle i closed my eyes and thought through the whole process i could hear the music in my mind and realized that if i pulsated between two notes while pedaling it would be easier for me to make it groove even at a low volume i was excited and couldn't wait to try it i mean i couldn't wait to do it when we hit the stage we started with an instrumental piece once the sax player started soloing i listened intently planning my attack this is the perfect time as soon as he started his third chorus, I dove in, pedaling the root note and the minor seventh two octaves up. I hadn't told Michael that I was going to use two notes, but when I did, he gave me an approving nod. I brought the volume way down and Ralph followed. Michael stopped playing chords and went to a single note rhythm that really created space. It was then that I realized what we were doing. We were creating a whole right in the middle of the music that allowed the soloist to stand there out in the open. We also simplified the music, directing all of the attention to the soloist. The sax player was standing there in the middle of a musical vacuum, and the audience had to take notice. They really did. The whole audience stopped what they were doing and started listening to the saxophone solo. It was brilliant. After the appropriate amount of time, I started bringing the volume back up. Again, Ralph followed. As we executed the perfect crescendo, I started walking down the scale notes of the song until I landed firmly on the root and resumed the original groove in prodigious fashion. I could feel the effect of what was happening. Everyone in the room burst into thunderous applause, including the waitress and bartenders. 
In between chords, Michael gave me a shot in the arm to show his approval. He was smiling heavily at me. The rest of the audience continued clapping and cheering for the sax player, who was more inspired than he'd been all night. He soloed for two more chords. Uh, he soloed for two more choruses, and you could almost see the joy coming through his skin. The audience was leaving the bar to fill the seats up front. They were listening. They were on our side, and the band felt it. The rest of the night was one of the best I've had in Nashville. I felt as if it was a start of something good. <laughs> hmm. Dynamics. Hmm. Corey, are you listening to this? <laughs> are you listening to this, buddy? I feel like we talk about dynamics a lot, or I bring it up a lot. <clears throat> oh, I'm not claiming any kind of perfection here, <laughs> right? <laughs> In any way, shape, or form. <laughs> hmm. The way we work with people. I guess the way we work with anything. The audience was leaving the bar. Oh, wait, wait, I read that. Once the gig was over, a lady named Jonelle, Jonel, Jonelle, J-O-N-E-L-L, -L, came over and told me that she liked my playing. I'd noticed her in the club, but didn't know who she was. Jonelle. She was a beautiful, short, auburn-haired lady who looked like she could hold her own. Somewhat of a cross between Janis Joplin and Bonnie Raitt. <laughs> That's crazy. That's what people tell me. Those people. What a, what a compliment, right? Uh, That's crazy. Okay. Uh, she mentioned that she was looking for a bass player to sub in her band for a few nights. I told her that I was available, and we exchanged numbers. Later, Michael told me that she was one of the best singers in the country. I made a mental note to contact her sooner rather than later. I hadn't felt so good in ages, but I also felt that I owed it all to Michael. When I mentioned that to him, he refused all credit. Twenty years from now, he said, this knowledge will be looked upon as your own. Therefore, it should be looked upon now as your own. But this gig wouldn't have happened this way if it weren't for you, I told him. I don't think it would have happened at all if it weren't for you. So I thank you for it. Thank me all you want, but don't give me credit for what you've done. You played well tonight, and it is you, I think. Thank me for what, I asked. For making me proud, he answered. It almost sounded cliche, but it touched me deeply, for I could tell that he was sincere. I couldn't think of anything else to say, and it didn't seem quite appropriate to give him a hug in front of the guys, so I just answered, you're welcome. Wow, that gave me a tinge of emotions, like I almost felt like I was like, oh, that's so cool. He walked over to the bar where the other band members were sitting. Although they had picked up their equipment, they couldn't leave. They were still energized from the gig. Oh, yeah. We were, oh, yeah. We were also still waiting for the owner to pay us. <laughs> <clears throat> the whole band was excited they commented on how much they enjoyed playing with michael and me <clears throat> ralph told me that he would make sure cliff knew how well we had done that made me feel great and i hoped it meant more gigs the sax player apologized to michael for his earlier attitude and told him that he hoped to play with him again sometime michael thanked him and suggested that he remember to use his mind not just his fingers Michael glanced at me and winked. <laughs> Some time later, I played another gig with the same horn player. After doing his usual warm-up routine, I saw him take a seat in the corner and close his eyes, using his mind. Michael had a way of influencing everybody he came in contact with. Once we got paid, we noticed Michael was nowhere to be found. I let him know that I would probably be seeing him in the morning. His money was given to me to pass on to him. I was accustomed to Michael showing up unexpectedly, but it was strange for him to disappear in such a fashion. Since we hadn't arrived together, I decided not to worry about him and walked to my car. As I arrived, I found Michael sitting on the hood. I knew you wouldn't take it if I gave it to you, so I'll, 
I knew you wouldn't take it if I gave it to you, so I allowed them to give it to you, he said. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about, he answered. What? I'm not taking your money. It's for you. I don't need it. You do. Plus, it's already in your pocket. Keep it. You earned it tonight. If I ever need it, I know where you live. I can do that, I told him. Listen, at this point in my journey, music is life, and I do not need money to play it or live it. Money is not something I play for any, money is something I not, rather, money is not something I play for anymore. It used to be at one time, but now I play for other reasons. Tonight, I played for you. And the way you played, you've already paid me well. Dude. I didn't know how to respond. Thank you, Michael. You are incredible. No, I'm better than that. He smiled, turned, and walked away. I longed to be at his level. As strange as he was, he was the most real person I knew. I couldn't imagine anyone else who would have done that for me, or who would have done for me what he had done. I knew that he was sincere about everything he'd said, and it touched me deeply on many levels. That is true dynamics, I whispered to myself. Feeling emotional, I watched him ride off into the moonlight on his skateboard. Boom! <laughs> oh, well, that is the chapter for today, everyone. And I will return tomorrow, probably in the evening. Well, actually, I don't know when, but I will be here tomorrow. Maybe the morning, but maybe at night, too. Um, I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining me here. And thank you, Victor. Thank you, Michael. Dudes, it's a brand new week. Woo! Yeah, and in four days, we got a full moon. Hey, 222 right now. It's 222. <laughs> so dang, I love yous. And um, I'll see you next time. Take care of yourselves. Mwah! Do it like you feel it. Thank you so much.